My advice is just make sure you feed on some healing scriptures every day because sick.
Let's stand together. We're going to pray and dismiss and get into the Word tonight. And God's good and you're blessed. I appreciate you being here. It's the holiday season and we pray that you've had a very Merry Christmas and that you have a great new year. And we've sown good seed to reap good harvest and we're believing God for good things. So let's pray. Father, now we thank you for this precious opportunity to open your word with great reverence and respect, with fear and trembling. We open the word of God that you might speak to us from your word, the Holy Scripture. God, breathe into us. By your spirit, teach us your word, teach us Jesus, show us the way, let us see clearly, let us believe accurately, and let us speak boldly. In the name of Jesus, tonight is the ministry, and I preach myself in the auditorium and through the internet. I pray that the words will be powerful and prophetic and prolific and penetrating and piercing to the heart, and God, that you'll change us from glory to glory, faith to faith, and strength to strength, to the spreading of your gospel, and to the glory of your name. And we thank you, good seed sown in our hearts, produces great fruit, hundredfold to your glory. And we said together, amen. All right, God bless you. Young people, children, you may go. God bless you. If you're in the auditorium, you can go ahead and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy 1, 7. 2 Timothy 1, 7. And we take a moment as we're opening our Bibles tonight to welcome you, our internet family. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate you and we pray that you're having a very Merry Christmas and you're enjoying your holiday and uh, with your family and receiving and believing God. We're trusting God for his best for you right now in Jesus' name. We're asking God for his best, for his strength. And we pray tonight as we study that you will receive Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing here by the word of God. Be blessed, be encouraged. And let's grow together in faith and in grace and in knowledge. God bless you. Thank you for your partnership in Christ. All right. Back to our study tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. Now, we're studying this yoke of bondage that people get into. And we're not going to do a lot of review there because we want to go further tonight. But just to remind you that this yoke of bondage, there are five things that believers get yoked to that hinder that cause great struggle, sweat, difficulty. Number one is strife. You want to stay out of strife. Don't get into strife. Walk in love. And sometimes strife is the easier path. It's the easier way. But God commanded us to walk in love. And I'm committed, and I've asked God to help me commit, to walk in love where every man, woman, boy, and girl are concerned, and walk in love and peace and let the peace of God rule my heart. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, follow peace with all men. That means peace is leading you. If you're following, something else is leading. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any root of bitterness spring up. And you have to guard your heart. And I've had to go back through my heart again and again. Because when you get in church and you get in ministry, it's easy to get bitter. It's easy to get hurt. At home, at the job, it's easy. And he warns us there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, any root of bitterness. Not the root, as often is quoted, but any root of bitterness. The smallest amount of bitterness can be poison to your very soul. And we've all been bitter about something against someone at some point. So we have to guard our heart. And I pray daily, Lord, let all bitterness be uprooted for me. So I want no strife in my life. And then if you go to Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, he said, let all bitterness, anger, wrath, clamor, evil speaking with all malice be put away from you. And he said, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And then he said in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, holy elective God put on bowels of mercy. That means from the heart of mercy, bowels of mercy, uh, kindness, gentleness, temperance, goodness. He said, put these things on. And then he said, and if any man have a quarrel against any, forgive as God forgave you in Christ. That's tremendous. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And then he says in uh, verse 15 of chapter 3 of Colossians, let the peace of God rule your heart, to which you're also called in one body, and be thankful. So you let peace rule. If anything violates my peace, I won't be a part of it very long. 
Anything that violates my peace, I won't be party to it very long. So God's commanded us to walk in love. So let's just make it very simple. When you get in strife, when you get upset, when you get bitter, when you get hurt, you get aggravated, frustrated, irritated, agitated, then at that moment, you start being yoked to something that's not good nor God. So we have to agree. So I've come out of strife, and I want no strife in my life. I'm not going to fuss, fight, argue with anybody. It's not necessary. We believe God. We trust God. And if you oppose me, my ways please the Lord. He'll make even my enemies be at peace with me. Proverbs 16, 7. And that word has become a standard and a staple in my life. And I'm so thankful. With, a, with an honest conscience before God, I can now bless those that curse me. I'm doing that now. I can do it with an honest heart. Pray for those that despitefully use me. And then love those that even hate me. And I'm thankful. Thank God it's a short list out there. There's a lot of people that don't care one way or the other, but a short list of people that hate me and despise me and curse me. There's a couple, but we bless them. We honor them. We give thanks that Christ died for them. We bless them. And when you do that with a trembling heart before God, then God takes your part. And he says in First Thessalonians there, he tells you that it is a righteous thing for God to recompense trouble to those that trouble you in the book of Thessalonians. So if somebody keeps troubling you, eventually God will get them something else to do. He'll make sure that you're not the object of their focus anymore. He will give them something else to do. So we're thankful tonight. We're not walking in strife. Number two, where we are, and we'll come back to this, is fear, care, and worry. Number three was murmuring and complaining. So how'd you do over Christmas? No murmuring? No complaining? No fussing? No fighting? No arguing? No, it's not necessary. In everything, give thanks. I talked to someone today uh, before I came over to church, distant partner in a distant city. And um, I said, well, how's your day? Awful, terrible. And I said, praise God. Praise God. And the lady said to me, she said, well, you do it for me. I said, I will, but it'd be better if you do it with me. Praise God. I used to do that with Scotty Todd. I complained to Scotty Todd. He's one of my mentors. He's in heaven now. But I'd say, Scotty, I'm having a rough go. He'd look at me and go, praise God. Oh, <laughs> a couple of times I just really want to pop him real good. But the Lord said he'd give me the desires of my heart. <laughs> that may be out of context. But I remember Scotty saying that to me over and over again. I said one time before I learned better, I said, Scotty, I'm in the valley. He said, praise God, man. That's where the lilies grow. And they don't toil or spin. So be like a lily and don't toil or spin. Why, well, not even Solomon in all of his glory. And I'm just thinking, this guy's got an answer for everything. I want to talk about my trouble. And he wants to talk about how good God is and how much God cares. So I've learned not to murmur. If there's any murmuring in me, I want it out of my life. I want it to be free from it. No murmuring. I exchange my murmuring, complaining for giving a thanks. Give thanks. When things go wrong, give thanks. And when they go more wrong, double up on your thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is your accelerator in Christ. Colossians 2, 7, last line. Abounding in Christ with thanksgiving. You abound in Christ with thanksgiving. The more I'm thankful, the more I truly am grateful. I was pulling in my driveway this afternoon, and you know we started the year with a mortgage on our house, and we retired it this year, just like we did the church. And I, I pulled into a driveway, that's paid for. I pulled in and walked in a house that's paid for. I don't know a mortgage on my house anymore. And I said, God, I am so thankful. You're so good to me. And just with gratefulness and thanksgiving, I walked in the doors and got on my knees and just thank God for how good he's been to me. I'm thankful. Truly am thankful. Then number four is unbelief. And, and it's very easy to get under unbelief because you don't believe God any more than you believe his word. And if the word says one thing and you say something else, you're in unbelief. If the Word says you're healed and you keep saying you're sick, then you're in unbelief. So God wants us to be in agreement with the Word. And agreeing with the Word is where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing what God said, and we agree with God. And then finally, is your own flesh. When you get over into the realm of flesh and you're not walking and letting your spirit dictate how you live, you get over into the carnal mind, get over into living by the body and what your body wants to do. That's flesh, and God will teach us through this series how to deal with those things so we can come out from among those things, be separate, and be received of the Father and celebrated in God. And 2 Corinthians 6, 16-18 tells you that if you'll come out and be separate, God will celebrate you. 
He will celebrate you. He absolutely will celebrate you. I'll receive you unto myself. I'll be to you a father. You'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Then Paul says, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There are five yokes there that we want to come out of. And this is reference back to Joshua chapter 10. Remember, the king of Hebron means a seat of association or to be yoked to. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. I want to ask you a question. What is Jesus' yoke? Before I take the yoke, I want to know what it is. Jesus said, take my yoke. And here's the good news. Jesus was yoked to one thing and one thing only. He was yoked to the Father. I and my Father are one. So if I take on Jesus' yoke, then I'm yoked to the Father. And I will live in the Father dimension. And I have a Father. So here we read these, these precious words from 2 Timothy 1.7. Now looking at God wants us free from all fear, care, worry, anxiety, and stress. God wants you free from it. So he said, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So this is a spirit, and it doesn't come from God. And God didn't give it to you. God did not give me the spirit of fear, trouble, worry, anxiety, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So the sound mind that God speaks of here operates... Without fear. No worry, no stress, no care. Yeah, but Brother John, it's just natural. It's just human to worry. It is, but you're not just a human. You're born again, son or daughter of God. You've been born again, born from above. You're not just a human being. No, your spirit's been recreated in Christ. Your spirit's brand new. You're a brand new man, woman in Christ. And so therefore, you're son or daughter of God. You have access to the Father. So God didn't give me the spirit of fear, but he gave me the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So then I'm going to walk in the power of love and of a sound mind. Now, let's read Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 15. Romans eight fifteen, And we will quote from verse 14. Where he says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So he's talking about us. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. Look at Romans 8.15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now notice this. God didn't give it, but you haven't received it. So if the spirit of fear comes to you and God didn't give it, then in order for you to have it, you have to receive it. But the good news is because you're born again. Because you're sons and daughters of God, you have a right to reject the spirit of fear. You don't have to receive anything that doesn't come from God. Remember Luke 13, the woman with the spirit of infirmity? This woman ought to be loosed, being a daughter of Abraham. So her first birth qualified her to be loose. Your second birth is a million times greater than her first birth ever could have been. You're born again. If you be in Christ, you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So you have a right to be delivered. But you notice you can't receive it. See, a lot of people receive the spirit of fear, even though it doesn't come from God. Because it's natural. When you look with these eyes and hear with these ears and watch people and watch circumstances and listen to the news report, it's natural to be afraid. But God's called you to live above the natural in the supernatural. And that means living without fear. I can honestly say I've not had one thought or fear about the virus called COVID. Not one. The first thing God said to me when that came on the television several years ago, I was getting ready for bed on a Saturday night, and they said, first case of COVID announced has come to Kershaw in South Carolina. The first case was diagnosed in Kershaw. And they told how it got here because they were pretty sure that a man was in, uh, in Hong Kong in China, and he flew back to Seattle. And then he flew to Atlanta. And then he flew over to Columbia. And he came back to Kershaw to see his mother. And she got it. Elderly woman got it. And I'm thinking, man, that's a long way for a virus to travel. And, and they started talking about what they called a, a coming pandemic. And, and I said to myself, and I said to Teresa out loud, I said, that's going to be a big deal before it's over. And in the natural, I was right. But then the Spirit of God said, it's nailed to the tree. It's nailed to the tree. I bore it. You're healed of it. Now receive your healing before it ever gets here and thank me that you're healed. Well, thank God I've not had COVID. Thank God I haven't had it. What if it comes? Well, I won't change anything. I'll just keep believing God by his stripes I'm healed. Some of you have had it. Thank God. Look, you're here tonight. It didn't take you out. It didn't kill you. 
Because you're prayed for daily and you stand boldly and say, Thank God by His stripes I am healed. Thank God He's my life and strength and I will live and not die and declare God's work in my generation. God is my strength. I'm healthy, whole, well in Christ, and I'm prospering and in health even as my soul prospers. That's how you deal with that. God did not give me the spirit of fear. So if you're afraid and worrying, you had to receive it. And so then we'll read one more verse tonight before we get into the true lesson tonight. Let's go back to Luke 10. And remind you of this, and then we'll get started tonight. Luke chapter 10 and uh, verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. So Martha received Jesus into her house. It'd be good for all of us to receive Jesus into our house. I received Jesus into my heart, my mind, my body, my home, my family, my finances. I received Jesus. So she received Jesus into her house. And she had a sister called Mary which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And then it said, and Martha was cumbered. That means troubled, aggravated, agitated about much serving. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore she should come help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you're careful. You're full of care and worry. Let not your heart be troubled. It's one of the worst things that can happen to you as a believer when you get your heart full of trouble. See, it's one thing for a boat to be in the water. It's another for the water to be in the boat. See, it's one thing for you to be in the midst of care, in the midst of fear. You can be there. Fear's all around you. I mean, fear is everywhere. Care, trouble, anxiety, worries everywhere. But it's another matter altogether to get that inside you. Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. Now, you can have trouble all around you, but if it ever gets in you, it's like water in a boat. It'll sink you. So he said, Martha, you are cumbered. You are careful about many things and troubled about many things. And one thing is needful. So his word must become the one thing to you that is needful. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then to that, Matthew 4, 4, write down in your notes there, Job chapter 23, verse 11 and 12. I have not gone back from the commandment of your lips. I have esteemed your word more than my necessary food. Job 23, verse 11 and 12. I've esteemed, I hold up, I regard, I reverence your word more than my food. As much as I'm going to feed my body, I'm going to feed my spirit with the word of God. This word takes the place of the unseen Jesus. This is Jesus in print. This, I can expose my senses to this. I can, I can touch the word of God. I can see it. I can hear it. I can read it. I can quote it. I can speak it, and it's the Word of God. You believe this is the Bible, God's Word? I believe this is God's Word, God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do tonight. Praise God. So one thing is needful. Now listen very prayerfully. Mary hath chosen. So this was a choice. You're always going to make choices. God still anoints choices. Right choices, wrong choices. Good choices, Bad choices, godly choices, ungodly choices. One thing is needful, and Mary chose that good part. And listen, it shall not be taken from her. And when I choose the word that cannot be taken from me, Satan comes immediately to take away the word, the word that was sown in their heart. So when you have a word, and Jesus said it won't be taken from you, you stop feeling forsaken. You stop being mistaken, and you stop being shaken. Because you have God's Word. And God's Word then becomes the foundation of your deliverance from fear. You're delivered from fear by God's Word. So I like this one. Here's my favorite fear-free scripture. Favorite fear-free scripture. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you and I will help you. And I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness, saith the Lord. Isaiah 41.10. Now, I use that verse every day. That's a life verse for me. I have about 10 or 12 I use every day. Isaiah 41, 10. Listen to it. Just fear not. I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness, saith the Lord. Isaiah 41, 10. There it is in print for you to read. It never changes. I guarantee you, if you open your Bible and you have a King James Version, it'll say exactly what I quoted, Isaiah 41, 10, and that's yours no matter where you are. But I'm going under, Lord. I'll uphold you. But Lord, I feel so weak. Yea, I will strengthen you. I feel helpless. I will help you. 
See, it answers every question there. What a loaded verse, Isaiah 41.10. So one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part. So I choose tonight to believe His Word. I choose tonight to come out of the yoke of fear, and I choose not to worry, be afraid, or have a care about anything. So do you remember this movie, Hakuna Matata? You know that one? My problem-free philosophy, no worries for the rest of my days. Now, of course, Timon and Pumbaa, if you saw the movie, which is my second favorite movie, Wizard of Oz is first, watch it the other night, laugh just hysterically, <laughs> just hysterical. If you know what to look for in the Wizard of Oz, it's amazing. It's a great movie. But this one, the cartoon, not the new version, but the old cartoon when it first came out. This one, they had a carefree philosophy, but their idea was is just to shirk responsibility and not be responsible and just to loaf out all day and not worry about anything no matter what happens. That's not how God does this. God puts you in a place where you don't fear because Jesus wore a crown. You don't fear because he died on the tree. You don't fear because God's not giving you the spirit of fear. You don't fear because God is for you. Jesus is with you. The Holy Ghost is in you. Angels are around you. God's word is true. He does not lie. He cannot fail. And you are what God says you are. You have what God says you have. And you can do what God says you can do. And you are the blessed seed of Abraham in Christ. You are filled and free. Your foundation is sure. You are God anointed, God appointed, God ordained. And he will not leave you nor forsake you. And you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. The Lord is my helper. It's not based on some abstract idea that you're just not going to worry about anything and everything around you go to hell in a handbasket. That's not what this is. This is about you learning to just rest in Him. Trust Him. Believe Him. Thank Him. Rest in Him and refuse to let that stuff in your soul realm. It doesn't belong to you. God did not give you the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. You've not received the spirit of bondage. And when you receive the spirit of fear, you're going back in bondage. See, he brought you out to get you free from the bondage, not to go back into it. So Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same that he through death might destroy him that had the power of the devil, that is to say the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And if you're afraid to die, then you're always going to be afraid to live. They've often said, and great men have said, you know, uh, you know, bold and brave men only live for a moment, but cowards never live at all. So at some point, you've got to be bold enough, brave enough, with all boldness to step up and say, thank God the word's true, and I'm going to stand in the midst of this without fear. I don't have to be afraid. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. All right, tonight. Number one, what I gave you, and you're taking notes, number one, was maturity and then the confusion that happened to me in my experiences. I showed you in 1983, I started out in independence at my first church, and I didn't have anything but the Word of God, and I never had a care, and the finances just moved and flourished and were blessed. God sent a millionaire in there, Levin Smith. Started blessing me, and it just, it just supernaturally turned around. In four years, we built a new fellowship hall. All the bills were called up. Everything was taken care of. It was just amazing what God did, and I never had one care. And when I started ministry, pastoring that church in uh, 1983, July 17th on a Sunday, we owed everybody in the county. We owed mortgage payments behind. We owed the oil company. We owed the phone company. We owed the water company. Everything was behind, and we had no money. On the first day of January, January 84, it was a Sunday, we had remodeled the sanctuary. We got new carpet, new pews paid for. We had called every bill up, and we had 87 cents in the bank. Now, to most people, if you only got 87 cents in the bank, you're poverty-stricken, you're destitute. But to me, based on where I'd been, I was a multimillionaire. See, 87 cents was a landslide. When I told the people what we had done financially, and I never did push, you know, our ladies at Independence, they were so sweet. They used to get up every Friday and go down to the, to the store and get all this stuff and go down to the corner, and they chop onions and make slaw and sell hot dogs and everything to make the church uh, budget. And I told them, I said, ladies, that's not necessary. We're not going to do that anymore. And a couple of them got angry with me and said, now, if we don't do this, we're going under. I said, no, ma'am, we're not going under. No, ma'am. Now you got to remember, I'm all of 22 years old. 
I'm 22, and they think, young and dumb. You're going to find out the hard way, son. If we stop selling these hot dogs, we're going under. Because people would come up to me and say, well, where do you pastor? And I'd tell them, and they'd say, oh, yeah, that's a hot dog church. <laughs> Ooh, you guys make a good hot dog. And I'm thinking, well, I pastor, that makes me the hot dog pastor. I'm a hot dog. So, and, and I, I told the church, I said, listen, I don't want us to be known for selling hot dogs. And, you know, a lot of Pentecostal churches are known for apple pies and their dinners and their hobo suppers. But they're not known for healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the leper, discharging dead. That's not what they're known for. They're known for putting on great hobo suppers and making great bake sales. There's a lot of Pentecostal churches that ought to have a rotisserie on top of them where they got an old coat for rummage, they got a Krispy Kreme donut box because they've sold donuts, and they got a chicken sacrificed to the Most High God to make it. Jehovah Jireh, we sacrificed to the Most High God. A lot of chickens gave their life so we could be a Pentecostal church. Well, when I stopped all that, we didn't do any of that. And we had 87 cents. We had 87 cents. But I said, look, you got, you're standing on new carpets. You've got new pews. And here's beautiful. We had this Israeli blue carpet and these, these nice pews that God gave us and put him all paid for. Somebody donated those, gave them to us. And the oil bill was caught up. We had the oil tank full. And it was paid in advance. The phone bill was paid up. The mortgages were all cut up. We solidified the one mortgage. Got it all taken care of and got ready to start building a fellowship. And I said, this year we'll start building. And God's meet our need. And they stood up. Those people stood up in Independence, Virginia. There's about 100 of them. They stood up and gave me a standing ovation. They stood up and said, you're the only one that's ever got us here. It's the first time we've ever started a year out where we went behind and they come to us and said, we need to catch up and we need to catch up and we need to catch up and we've got to catch up. I didn't do that. I said, thank God he meets our needs and we're met. See, not a care, not a worry. See, that's maturity. At 21, 22 years old, I walked in maturity. Now let's roll the clock forward to 1996. When I got here and I got in that parking lot dilemma, I went backwards. So I got in confusion. I worried myself literally sick several times over that parking lot situation down there. Now, what's the difference? See, in 1983, I didn't have anything but the Word of God. Now, in 1996, I don't have anything but the Word of God. What's the difference? See, the Word of God has not changed. I really want you to hear this. The Word of God don't change. My problem wasn't the Word of God. My problem is that I didn't believe it in 1996. See, I refused to worry. Every time a bill would come, I'd just say, thank you, Lord, this is mad. Thank you for helping me. Thank you, this is mad. In 1996, what are we going to do? I better call my attorney. I better call Mark White. I better find out, is this what's going to happen? I better call the attorney. See, is my attitude is what's going on in here that kept me and robbed me of peace and got me over into fear. And I walked the floor wearing over parking lots. I, I had some sleepless nights going over parking lots. Then let's roll it up 10 more years. Now we go from two, uh, 1996, go up to 2005 when we started building, and look at me there. I'm worse off than I was in 96. See, here's the point. Faith should have grown. I should be more at peace in 96 than I was in 83. I should certainly be at more peace in 2005 than I was in 83. That's 22 years of growing and preaching. And my preaching developed. And, and my ability developed, and my administrative skills developed, and plus I had a lot more money. When we started this building program, we had $400,000 in the bank. Now, it's not a lot of money when you're building a building, but that's better than most. For, I mean, you'd like to have $400,000 in your bank account, wouldn't you? That'd be better than most people have. And so we had to give one hundred and fifty dollars of the contractor up front to get him started. So we got $250,000 in the bank, and we had a problem up here, and I got terrified, and I've got $250,000 in the bank. Now, watch the difference. In 1984, first Sunday of, of January, it's a Sunday morning, my grandfather was there. That Sunday had 87 cent full of joy. Had 87 cent full of joy. 87 cent. See, it's not the money that gives you the joy. God was my supply, and I was standing 10 feet tall in 1984 on the first Sunday of January, on that first day, January 1st, because God had helped me. I had walked into a place where nobody had ever been able to do what I did, and I just believed God. I'm not special. I didn't do anything special. I just did what Mary did. One thing was needful, and I chose the good part, and I just said it, and I believed it, and I thanked Him for it. He meets our need. He meets our need. He meets our need. Every one of these bills is paid, and thank God it's done, and I refuse to worry. But now in 2005, with $250,000 in the bank, I'm terrified, I'm worried, I'm upset, I'm walking the floor, and I'm crying out to God. Why? It's what I did with the Word. See, the problem's in here. See, the Word doesn't change. 
Are you listening? The Word doesn't change. The problem was not the Word. The problem was what I did. I took on Martha. I gave up my seat at Jesus' feet, and I took on that Martha spirit, and I began to fret and to worry and to have anxiety, and it's not necessary. The Word of God, just as good in 84 as it was in 2005 or 1996, or tonight, I should be in a place where I'm carefree. See, if I was carefree in 1983 and 84, how much more? Now, I've got a lot more responsibility. I'm responsible for a college. I'm responsible for the church. I'm responsible for a network of ministers. I've got a lot more responsibility. But if the Word hasn't changed, and I wasn't able to do that in independence because I was good at something, I did it because the Word works, praise God. The Word works. It, it, it wasn't that I was special. It's the Word works. And the Word still works tonight just like it did then. And then I told you about my travels, how that I was traveling in 1980 on October 25th, the day my sister got killed eight years later, and I got terrified and God set me free. But then in 2002, after 9-11, Steve and I were down in Orlando, and that bomb threat was on that plane. A guy tried to blow up that plane I was on, and terror gripped my heart, and I forgot what God said back in... Uh, 1980, I forgot. In 1980, I had faith. 1981, 82, I traveled free and without fear for all that time. As soon as that happened in Orlando Airport with that suitcase and then with that happened on the plane, they arrested that guy. Fear got in my heart. And I didn't want nothing to do with airports, airplanes, or travel. But in order to do my what I've got to do to fulfill my destiny, I'm going to have to fly. I'm going to have to go to some foreign lands. There's some things I've got to do. And if I don't fly, I will never get it done. So I want to thank God He's delivered me again. Praise God. He's delivered me. And the difference was, is what I did with the Word. So now you should be standing stronger tonight against fear and worry than you were five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. You've had time to grow. And you can handle more now than you could handle then. The Word doesn't change. You receive that? All right, so that's my maturity and then my confusion. See, when I was younger, and I'm embarrassed to tell you that, I mean, I don't want to be the kind of preacher that just tells you my success story. There are some preachers, they won't tell you any of their failures. I've had some amazing failures. <laughs> I've had some marvelous failures. I've had some failures that were epic and, and catastrophic. One time Reese came in when she was in preschool. She was four right before Heidi was born. And she'd been learning about iguanas. And she came in and she got me. She set me down. She was real concerned. She looked at me and she said, Papa, it would be a catastrophe if you get eat by an iguana. She couldn't say catastrophe. She said vertastrophe. And I looked at her and I said, it would be a vertastrophe if I get eaten by an iguana or an iguana because an, the closest iguana is probably in the Columbia Zoo and that would be really bad. So I'm not going to, I promise you, Reese, I will not be get, getting eaten by an iguana. And she said, well, please, Papa, don't get eaten by an iguana. I won't with God's help. <laughs> God's good. God wants you to grow. So I'm not going to be the one that just tells you my success story. I've had some bitter failures. I mean, I've got sidetracked several times. How about you? You just need to be honest. I think people will relate better if I could just be honest with you and tell you that if I believed that way in 1983 and 84 with no money and no help and hardly any people at that church and God just blessed it, then why wouldn't he do that now? I should just come in here without a, without a care, skipping and dancing, just say, whoo, praise God, we have God. And here's what got me. I heard preachers say this all the time, and I heard it again and again and again. If we only had the money, if we only had the money, if we only had the money. And God stopped me one day and said, I don't want you to ever say that again. You say this, I've got God and He's my Father and that's all I need. If I've got God, I've got all I need. If I've got God, we can build some buildings. If I've got God, we can build a college. If I've got God, I can walk in health. If I've got God, I can be strong all my days. If I've got God, i got everything I need. He's my Jarrah. Hallelujah. He's El Shaddai. If i got God, i got everything I need. And in my mind, I just got that etched. I look out here and I walk across this property. If we just had the money, I could see that building and those buildings and college back there. I could just see it. I, if I only had, and he's saying, I'm your God. What do I lack? What do I not have? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I could do in a moment what you could never do in a lifetime. Joseph was in a pit. Joseph was absolutely bound in slavery. And in one moment through an interpretation of a dream, he goes from a pit to a palace and becomes second to Pharaoh. And he's in charge basically of the whole world in one moment. 
a moment of God's favor will do more for you than you can do in a lifetime. But I forgot that. I forgot that. I forgot that I'm always under the eye of my father. And he said, I will guide you with my eye. And I forgot that. And fear came in. And fear got in me. And I, I, I just got to where I was terrified to even think about going to an airport because that guy tried to blow up the plane. What if that happens again? He took care of me the first time. If it happens again, he'll take care of me the next time. I will not be on a plane that blows up. Why? He gives his angels charge over thee. They keep thee in all thy ways. He bears you up in your hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And because you've made the Lord my refuge, even the most high your habitation, no evil shall befall you. Neither any plague come nigh your dwelling. For I am the Lord your God. That won't change. That word won't change. That word won't change. Now, I'm not dumb enough. To get on an airplane, not quoting Psalms 91. But when I get on one, I'm quoting Psalms 91. When I get in my seat, I'm going to read Psalms 91. While I'm up in the air, it's Psalms 91. When I'm coming down, it's Psalms 91. Praise God. At Psalms 91, oh, keep any believer anywhere, anytime, no matter what they face. It's Psalms 91. See, the word won't change. The word won't change. So let's, let's get a few more thoughts here. So that's my maturity and my confusion. You see how when I was younger, it was, seemed to be easier. But as I got older and more mature, I let the influence of older ministers, I let the influence of what I've seen in church creep in and choke my faith and choke the Word in me and got to a place where I was crippled in my faith and I took on the care. The cares of this world enter in and do what? Choke the Word. And I want to be very, very blunt right here. If you got the Word of God in you and it's choked, it can't breathe. When you're choking, you can't breathe. And if the Word of God doesn't breathe, then it can't live in you. And if it doesn't live in you, it'll never come to pass. And there's nothing more frustrating for you to know that these things are true. For you to know that you know that this is true and it lives inside you and it's dead and dormant and won't come to pass. That's frustrating. That, that, that would be like a woman carrying... A, a, a dead fetus around five years later or, or ten years later. You, you've got, uh, it's supposed to be alive. What's in you is dead. You're carrying it around anyway. You know that it's not going to work. Jesus said it chokes the word and the word becometh unfruitful. Jesus said that. The cares of this world are so prolific and so profound, they get in you to an extent they can choke the word of God and make it where it won't work in your life. Beloved, we need to beware. Be sober, vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Doing what? Casting all your care on him. Why? He cares for you. Amplified says, lovingly, watchfully, and with all diligence, he cares for you. He feeds the raven, clothes the lily, but then not much more feed and clothe you or you a little faith. All right, so let's go on to number two. That's number one, maturity and confusion. You see that in my examples. I wanted you to see that. Very embarrassing, but nonetheless, we want to put that out there because some of you have had the same experience. 20 years ago, you got hit with a doctor's report and you bowed up and said, in the name of Jesus, that's not mine. And now you get hit with the same doctor's report and just, just knock you flat. Why? You've let the cares of this world come in. You've got to deal with this. All right, so that's number one. Number two, then, would be man in creation before the fall. So we go back to creation, and you always remember this when we go back to creation. Num number one is that the first thing you want to see when you go to creation, it's a sovereign act of God. God didn't need or allow permission from anyone or anything. Uh, he didn't ask the clay if he could make a man. He didn't ask the earth if it would bring forth trees. He just said, let. And when he said let, then the whole creation bowed to his will. First word in this dimension was, let there be light. So what did light do? Light appeared. And it wasn't the sun, moon, and the stars. What light was it? God is light. The sun, moon, and the stars weren't created till the fourth day. He said, let the sun, moon, and stars be created. And when they were, when that came out of his mouth, then the sun, the moon, and the stars were absolutely unveiled in the heavens. See, so there's sovereign act here. So this is sovereign. God steps in and he's not asking permission. He's not asking anybody. He takes this little blue ball called earth. To him, it's just a little blue ball. The planets would be just like marbles in his hand. Get that picture. You know, Saturn and Venus and Mars and, you know, the earth. Little, just little marbles in his hand. Get that picture. So it's just this little blue ball. And he steps into that little blue ball. And, and this God that fills the heavens and the earth, he tells Jeremiah, I feel heaven, earth. Where is there that I am not? 
David said, if I go to the morning, you're there. If I go into heaven, you're there. If I go into hell, you're there. Where can I flee your presence? God is ever. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. And he is omnipotent. So he doesn't ask permission from this little blue ball. He just says, let there be light. Let the dry land appear. Let the earth bring forth. And he's just talking to this blue ball. But then something strange happens. He then comes into this blue ball and he comes to make a man. And he says, let us make man in our own image. And the difference in man and what makes man different and special and unique above all else, above angels or any other creature, because the Bible will tell you in Psalms 33 that angels and the host of heaven were made by the word of the Lord. Every, everything there and everything here was made by his word. All of it. God said and it was so. God said and it was so. God spoke and it was so. That's the kind of God we're dealing with. If he says it, it's a done deal. When it comes out of his mouth, it becomes concrete. It becomes evidence. It becomes seen. Things that were not seen were made from things, or things seen were made from things not seen. They were framed by the Word of God, Hebrews 11, 3. So, it's sovereign. He doesn't ask permission. But then he comes and he makes this, this clay, and he makes this man, and he lifts him up. Now remember, God's big enough to hold this marble in his hands, but at the same time, he's in the earth, and he's making a man in his own image. And all of heaven and all the host, and all are watching him, and he picks him up and breathes into him, and he becomes a living soul. And at that point, Adam became a living soul, and Adam was exactly what God wanted him to be. You see, God didn't make him with the intent of having to fix him. He made him exactly what he wanted to be. So when we study, remember from Sunday, who, what, where, when, why, how. So you've got to go back and look at the mystery. Why did God make man? Because he wanted one. That's pretty easy. Why did he make a man? He wanted one. But what did he make him for? Eternally, man was made for one thing, and that's relationship. Man's not something that's going to ever end. Do you realize as sure as God, man has become? Because man will never end because of we that are born again. He's promised us life forever. He's not going to cut man off. If he was going to end man, he would have ended him after the fall. He certainly wouldn't have gone through all the trouble he went to to redeem us. He could have just said, all right, that's it. I don't want a man anymore and wiped him out. But he didn't do that, did he? So man was meant for eternal relationship. In the realm of spirit, man was made righteous. He had no sin. This man was created and the first thing he saw was God. First thing he heard was God. First thing he experienced was God. First breath, God was close enough to him where he breathed God in. That was his first breath. God breathed into him. His first breath in his natural lungs was God Almighty. That's amazing. And he was righteous. And when he awoke, he didn't hide himself. He didn't run. He wasn't afraid because he was made in righteousness. Righteousness. What God is was imputed to him. And spiritually, he stood in the presence of a holy God without any fear or sense of guilt, shame, or condemnation because God made him righteous. Then in the middle arena where we're studying tonight, God made him to be at rest. He had no fear. He had no worry. He had no anxiety. If you'd have went up to Adam in the garden before he fell and said, Adam, have you ever been afraid? He looked at you and said, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. What is fear? Or, have you ever been worried? I mean, you're in this garden. Have you ever been worried? What's worry? No ability to relate to it because it wasn't there. He made him to rest. In his body, he was rejuvenated, and he was to body was to renew itself every seven years. And he tells you emphatically that you will die only if you eat of this tree. Man was meant to live in that garden. His body would have rejuvenated every seven years on a perfect cellular level, and it would have just kept going. He would have never died. You will die in the day you eat this tree. His body was rejuvenated. In the social arena, he was reconciled because you see him when God puts him to sleep and takes a rib, makes the woman, he goes away from the man and makes a woman and brings her to him. Notice how he receives her. He takes her and he puts his arms around her and says, she is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken from man. Now notice he doesn't look at her and go, well, could you make her maybe three inches taller? The brown hair, not so much. I'd rather have a blonde. Brown eyes, let's do blue eyes, Lord. Did he say that? No. He never met her. They never went on a date. They never had a conversation. When he woke up from that rib issue, when he woke up from the rib, God brought him and brought the woman to the man. And when he saw her, without a conversation, without one date to Starbucks, without a coffee, 
without talking on the phone, without a text. Pretty amazing. He looks at her and he felt about her the same way God did. See, God was well pleased when he made the woman. Just as he was the man. He was well pleased. And Adam looked at her and he had the same thought, same heart, same passion for the woman that God did. And so he said, she shall now be called bone by bone, flesh of my flesh. And for this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And the two shall be one flesh. Without a conversation, that's the way God did that. That's spirit of reconciliation. That's the spirit of reconciliation in the garden. And then in the material arena, the bedellum, the onyx, the gold, the silver, the sapphire. Genesis chapter 2 tells you God put all the precious metals of the earth in that garden and he was rich beyond measure. Why? Because God wanted a man for relationship, to walk in righteousness, to be at rest, to be rejuvenated in health and strength, then to be reconciled and never have discord, and then to be rich in the material arena as God is rich in spirit. That's what God wanted. See, God had a perfect opportunity to do whatever he wanted because he's sovereign. But he made a man in his own image. And he gave the man a will. And he gave the man a choice. Why? Because if God had just built that beautiful garden and put the man in it, and then he would have just said, all right, all this is yours and given him no choice, then the man, for all intents and purposes, would have been nothing more than a glorified pet. A glorified pet. My little dog, Daisy. We keep her in the house. She's my dog. She's Teresa's dog. We love her dearly. She's, you know, I'm crazy about Miss Daisy. I love my little Daisy Bill. Fall in love. I fall in love with animals. Dog. Love that little dog. Me and her spend the afternoon. She's my prayer partner. She sits at my feet while I'm praying. And she spent a lot, logged a lot of time praying with me. But, you know, she is kept and she is confined. And there's certain things that she can't do. She has a will and she's free to operate in certain parameters. But there's some things she can't do. There's some things I won't let her do. Like, for example, I won't let her run out in the street and get run over. I can't do that. She has to stay in the house. And she's not going out there unless one of us have her on a leash and a chain. See, she's chained when she goes out. See, there's some boundaries. But God gives all this beauty and all this wonder, and he says, listen, see that tree? In the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. I don't give Daisy that choice to go out and say, Daisy, if you go out in the street, you'll surely die. Car run over you. People drive too fast up and down our road. They'll, you'll get hit, and you'll get hit by a car, and it'll be over. I don't give her that option. But God had to give the man that option. Why? Because God wanted to be chosen and to be trusted because he's love. And if you force somebody to love you, if you control somebody, if you force them to love you, if you force them to stay, if you force them to be there against their will, then that's not love. Love must be chosen and trusted. So man in creation above the fall for relationship, righteousness, rest, rejuvenation, reconciliation and riches there it is that's what god wanted and the good news is god never changes at all he's the same yesterday today and forever did not jesus teach us pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven which is to tell you emphatically that the earth is not working according to heaven if earth and heaven are the same, then there wouldn't be any need to pray His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Look at heaven. There's nothing in heaven that's not His will. Now, now think about this. This is something people need to understand in church. It's so important. There's nothing in heaven going on tonight that's not God's will. Not one thing. Do you believe that? Not one thing. All right. So then the preacher gets up and says, now, all right. Now, we know when we get to heaven, nobody will ever be sick again. Is that true? Absolutely. You'll have a glorified body. So no one will ever be sick again. But then start preaching about here. And you know, God put that cancer on you so you could learn how to be humble. See, God took cancer and put it on you to teach you to be humble. But now nobody will be sick in heaven. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So if nobody has cancer in heaven, then it's God's will that... See, th there has to be a reckoning of what God wanted. And then... Number two is the fall. And with the fall, relationship was broken. Man became unrighteous. Man lost his rest. I heard your voice and was afraid. He then began to die in his body. He began to argue and fuss in his relationships. 
and he was made poor under the spirit of greed. Now, I want you to take your Bibles. We've got about seven, eight minutes left. Take your Bibles to Deuteronomy 28, under the mental curse. So number two here, the mental curse. So if you're taking notes, one, maturity and confusion, that was me. Number two would be man and creation. Number three is the mental curse. Number three, the mental curse. So Deuteronomy 28. And rather than me just quote them, sometimes it's good to read it for yourself. Sometimes you need to see this is in your Bible. So Deuteronomy 28. And let's go to verse 28. 28, and you know that the curse starts in Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. The curse. What happened when Adam sinned? The curse. Deuteronomy 28, and start at verse 28. 28, 28. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 starts the curse. All right, verse 28. Deuteronomy 28, 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, blindness, and astonishment of heart. So circle that word madness in your Bible. I've got it circled in my Bible right here. Madness, all types of mental disease and mental disorders. All types of mental disease and mental disorders. Madness. Madness. So that means dementia, Alzheimer's, and all the above are under the curse of the law. You see that? It's right there. It's right here in your Bible. Madness. Blindness. Losing your eyesight under the curse of the law. And astonishment of heart. Then in verse 29. And you will grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. So you know not prospering in your ways is under the curse. I'm redeemed from not prospering. Praise God. That's good news. All right. And thou shalt be only oppressed, circle it, and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. So here, madness, all types of mental disease, mental disorder, and then oppression. That's all types of mental vexation and struggle. That's the spirits that come against your mind from without. That's the spirit of fear. That's the spirit of oppression, the spirit of anxiety. All these spirits that torment the soul of man. Just torment the soul of man. Then in the same chapter, Deuteronomy 28, go to 65. So those two things are under the curse. 65. And he said, and among these nations, and there you know to put the seven nations in. You remember what they were? The seven nations. You got imagination, condemnation, denomination, abomination, damnation, divination, stagnation. Those nations, you shall find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord there shall give thee a trembling heart, failing of eyes, that's also under the curse, and sorrow of mind. Now the difference between oppression and sorrow of mind, sorrow of mind comes from within. And if you've ever had a broken heart, if you've ever suffered a broken heart, you know what sorrow of mind is. And there were a few days there in 07. There were a few days there in 1987. There were a few days there in 1993 that the sadness was overwhelming. The sorrow, it was, it was in me. It wasn't outside me, it was in me. That's under the curse of the law. To have that old achy, you remember that song, achy, breaky heart? You remember that? For those of you that hopefully none of you caught the Cyrus virus, but nonetheless, don't tell my heart, my achy, breaky heart. Think about that. You people, Christians go around singing that. Might blow up and kill this man. No, I don't have an achy, breaky heart, and my heart ain't gonna blow up and kill this man. No. Not even in jest would I say that. Not even in jest. Why? Because my heart beats sound in my chest and thank God he healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. And thank God he healeth the broken hearted. Okay, sorrow of mind comes from within. And we've all experienced that. We've all know what that is. So he says sorrow of mind. And then thy life shall hang in doubt. Circle it. Doubt. Doubt's under the curse of the law. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee and thou shalt fear. So circle it. Praise God. Fear is under the curse of the law. Look at that. God didn't give you the spirit of fear. It's under the curse of the law. And he says, and you shall fear day and night and have no assurance. Circle it. No assurance of your life. And this is where people get the idea. God never promised you tomorrow. No, he didn't. But he promised you a long life. Did he not? Over and over again. For example, just one simple commandment. Honor your mother and father, 
that it may go well with you and your days may be long upon the earth. I've honored my mother and father. I have a right to believe then that my days will be long on the earth and that it will go well with me. Now we notice these six aspects of the mental curse. Madness, oppression, spirits without, sorrow of mind, broken heart from within, doubt, fear, and no assurance are under the curse of the law. You see that? That includes every torment of the soul. Everything that's plagued your soul, tormented your soul. It's all right there in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 66. It's under the curse of the law. Do you see it? Everybody see that? Couldn't be clear. That's under the curse of the law. Now, we're going to close tonight. Let's read our Emancipation Proclamation, Galatians 3, 13. Probably the most quoted verse here of all of our verses we quote. This is number one. Listen to it. And hear the trumpet sound. Now what do we read was under the curse? Madness, oppression, sorrow of mind, doubt. Your life will hang in doubt. I don't even know if I'll be alive tomorrow. Your life will hang in doubt. You will fear day and night. And you'll have no assurance of your life. Your assurance is the promise of God. He promised you you'd be fruitful in old age in Psalms 92. Did he not? They will bring forth fruit in old age. Well, you got to get to old age to bring forth fruit in old age. Did he not promise you in Isaiah 65 and verse 22, you will not build another inhabit. You will not plant another eat of the vineyard. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people on the earth. They will long enjoy the work of their hands. And old David died in a good old age full of honor, riches, and day. And Abram, you'll go to your fathers in peace in a good old age. And do what? Be buried. You know he's talking about his body. You can't bury a man's spirit and soul. Bury the body. All right, let's read it. Let's shout tonight. And then we're going to put those words in there, and then we'll stand and praise God. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ hath, past tense, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So Christ hath redeemed us from madness. Praise God. That means mental decline is not in my future. Praise God. My mind, I expect it to get quicker, faster, sharper, my memory to be better tomorrow than it was today. I'm believing God. All right, that's one. Number two, Christ redeemed us from oppression. It's under the curse of the law. Number three, Christ redeemed us from sorrow of mind. Number four, Christ redeemed us from doubt. Number five, Christ redeemed us from fear. And number six, He redeemed us from no assurance of our life. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Christ redeemed me. Now, you take that and you take it to Psalms 107, verse 2. And you write that one down. You already know it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So I am redeemed, and then you have to be bold here. Step up and say, I'm redeemed from madness. And just go a little deeper with that thought. You know, some of the things people do, like for example... For a man to get a, an automatic weapon and go in a theater and shoot people down that he doesn't even know, that's madness. You're redeemed from that kind of madness as well. But you're redeemed from losing your mind. You're redeemed from Alzheimer's and dementia. You're redeemed from it. He wore a crown. Blood was shed to redeem you from that. My grandmother Lily, just as saved as I am and loved God and loved Jesus, loved to sing about Jesus, loves me, told me about Jesus many times, but she suffered a vile death with Alzheimer's. She's redeemed from it, but she didn't know it. And see, this won't work unless the redeemed of the Lord say so. you got to put a testimony with it. The testimony is what? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So I'm redeemed from madness. I'm redeemed from oppression. I'm redeemed from sorrow of mind. I'm redeemed from doubt, fear, and no assurance. Tonight, I joyfully say, my soul is at rest. My soul is at rest. I'm redeemed by love divine. I'm redeemed by the blood. Jesus wore a crown and shed blood to redeem my soul. I am redeemed. I have the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. That's long enough tonight. Praise God. You have to enforce that with what you believe and say. 
And every time that your mind won't recall something, you stop and you address it and you say, now, in Jesus' name, mind, you go get that name up and you bring me His name now. You don't forget anything. I do this to myself every once in a while. I, I was thinking about a guy the other day. I thought about it. And I, he didn't cross my mind in 30 years. He just popped across my mind. I saw his face. I remembered our last conversation. But for the life of me, for the first few moments, I couldn't think of his name. And I stopped and said, Lord, I have the mind of Christ. Father, I thank you. I'm redeemed from madness. I thank you. I'm healed and my, my mind's quicker, sharper. What's his name? Go get his name. It's in there. Go get it. And about five minutes later, I went on and I stopped. I said, oh, yeah, that's his name. I remember him. That's his name. It's in there. You train your mind to do that. You're redeemed. Don't tolerate mental lasers. Don't tolerate mental weak. Don't do it. Don't give it an inch. If you give it an inch, it'll take a mile. You have the mind of Christ. Your mind is strong. I've got spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. And I will keep him in perfect peace who has his mind stayed on thee because he trusts thee. Trust in the Lord Jehovah in him is everlasting life and strength. Now you bow your head and heart and pray for the internet family while I Tell them good night. Internet family, you're redeemed from the curse of the law. Madness, oppression, sorrow of mind, doubt, fear, no assurance. They're not yours. God didn't give you the spirit of fear. That's not yours. That's under the curse. And Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law. But that won't work until you're willing to believe it and say it with your mouth. Psalms 107, too, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He's redeemed you from the hand of your enemy. So right now, I stretch forth my hand to you in Jesus' name, and I call your soul prosperous and blessed. Your soul is a well-watered garden. Your soul is set in the heavens, clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, crowned with 12 stars on her head, and she is blessed. The mind of Christ operates in you, and you have the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. That's yours in Jesus' name. Now receive it, and thank God for it, and we appreciate you, our family, our partners, and we love you, and we'll see you Sunday morning. We'll be here Sunday morning. We'll have regular church service Sunday, uh, New Year's Eve. And we're going to talk about the vision as the Lord wills and directs. And uh, some great things God has ahead for us. But you're redeemed. You enforce your redemption by thanking God continually. I'm redeemed. My mind, my soul is prosperous. And I'm in health and prosper even as my soul prospers. In Jesus' name, we'll see you Sunday if not before. Good night.